Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies grooving With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music my Bigfoot sighting happened December 16th of 2020. My name is Michael Bluler. I'm from Biloxi, Mississippi. I've always been an avid hunter my whole life. To kind of paint a picture of what happened to me, I need to tell the story of certain hunting seasons and stuff that goes on here because it paints the picture up to what happened to me. I never really believed in Bigfoot or anything like that. I never had cryptids on my mind or anything like that ever. Just wasn't on my radar. I can remember when I was a kid back in the late seventies, I can remember seeing the Patterson Gimlin film on TV, you know, late at night. And my parents would always say, you know, that's somebody in a suit walking just never paid any close attention to it. And even if it was real, you know, that's not something that would happen where I'm at, not in Mississippi. That if that was true at all, you know, that was a problem out in the Northwest, you know, nothing like that. So to paint the picture, I'm an avid hunter, avid bow hunter. Mississippi's kind of strange down here. They have two dog seasons. And what I mean by dog seasons is they're not, they're not hunting dogs. They're using dogs to hunt deer. And I've tried it when I was younger and stuff. Not a big fan of it. Really dangerous. A lot of drinking going on and stuff like that. And these hunters, you know, they kill anything. So we have two seasons of that. Uh, we have one season that lasts like two weeks. And then the last dog season comes in. It lasts like a whole solid month, like the whole month of December. And I've always bypassed that because I'm just not a fan of it. So I would always go to a W, you know, wildlife management area to hunt because, you know, it's protected and there's a lot of game wardens in there and stuff like that. They're not allowed to use dogs to hunt in there. If they get caught, you know, they're going under the jail. So that's what I used to do every year when them two dog seasons would come in. And there was one particular WMA that I really enjoyed. I had a lot of luck. It was called Leaf River Management Area. It's in Perry County, Mississippi. That is like two counties up from me. I'm in Harrison County, Mississippi. And uh, there used to be this huge, huge ryegrass field that was slapped in the middle of this wildlife management area. I mean, it was huge. When I say huge, it's like 200 yards wide and 1,000 yards long. And there was power lines that ran adjacent to the west of it. You know, they ran north and south. And I always used to like to go down in power lines and probably get about 200 yards behind this ryegrass field. And the reason I did that is because here in Mississippi are very smart and very skittish. And it's because of the hunting pressure. A lot of people, they hunt directly on the field and it never have no luck. Deer do come out on these fields and eat, but they're very nocturnal. They will not come out on these fields until, you know, it's pitch black dark because they know that, you know, there's nobody in the woods after dark. You know, they got us figured out pretty much throughout the years. So what I used to do is I used to get behind this field on the power line about 200 yards north of it. And uh, there was a little spot that was cut out of there. It was kind of shaped like a triangle. I used to always call it the wedge. And I had my favorite pine tree. I would get up and I would get up super high. We're talking 30 foot high. If the wind's not blowing that day, I'll go up as high as 50 feet. So high that you have to use a safety harness, you know, just for a good peace of mind. And the reason I chose this spot is because it was like a corridor. I always had a lot of luck because 
right before dark, I would catch deer slipping across the power line, setting up to come on this field when it gets dark. And I've had tremendous luck throughout the years. And I knew this spot like the back of my hand. I mean, there was a time in my life, I think it was probably two years before my encounter. I went to this spot just about every day. I mean, it, I was drawn into this place big time. Loved it. So it was a normal day. It was December the 16th, 2020. Normal day. No rain. Beautiful day. Cool. Probably, you know, in the mid 30s, which is cold for down here. If it gets 32 degrees down here, we're not used to that. People treat it like you're in Antarctica. So, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful day. It's getting dark, probably around 5.30ish, somewhere around in there. And I always get up my tree super early. Say it's getting pitch black at 5.30. I'm up my tree at 1. No problem. And that's just to get the woods calm down after walking through and let my smell leave. Because deer, they rely on their nose. Deer do not see very well. I mean, they can see, but... They can't see as good as like a cat or a dog. or They don't see in black and white, but they're more like uh, just kind of colorblind, really bad. So I was up the tree and it was a normal day. I got comfortable and everything was beautiful. Had the perfect wind. If you're a hunter, you always want the wind to be hitting you in the face. And it was beautiful. But I just noticed there was just something strange. There was just something off. There was just no action. Not a bird chirping, not a squirrel in a tree, not a raccoon on the ground, not an armadillo. Just It was just scary, 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 dead, nothing going on. And a couple hours passed, and I'm like, this is just very strange. You know, usually I'll see like a small deer or something pass by or something, nothing like that. You know, something that I'm not going to shoot. And I was just puzzled by that. And I waited, you know, I was a trooper. I stayed there and uh, it got to be about 410, 415. And I finally get some action. I hear something behind me. Another thing I have to say is Mississippi is very, very thick. South Mississippi, very thick. Uh, the underbrush will kill you if you try to, not literally, but it's just really bad. Um, a lot of briar bushes, a lot of gallberry bushes, just nasty. They have to do prescribed burns in South Mississippi a lot just to kind of get a handle on it a little bit. So I get the sound behind me, and I can't turn around because I don't want to move. It's heavy. It sounds very heavy. Probably about 50 yards behind me, and it's coming in super slow. And I noticed... It's not moving fast. It's like, I'm wondering if this thing sees me or not. And, uh, I mean, it just walks to the right of me about 30 yards from me and stops. And I can't see it. And I'm up over this thing. I cannot see it. I start hearing heavy breathing, almost like labored breathing, like uh, something that has like a chest cold. And I have a million things going on in my head. I'm like, okay, is this a deer that got shot or is this a pig that got shot? And it's maybe it's lungs is filling up with blood. Is it going to die right here on the side of me? I, I can't see anything because it's just, I'm looking over it, but it's just too thick to see down there. And that goes on for about a minute and a half or so. And it, everything stops. And I'm like, you know, thinking to myself, what was that? What in the world was that? So I'm puzzled. And I don't hear anything anymore. I'm like, you know, that kind of that, that kind of stinks because, you know, I, I really would have liked to see what that was. You know, at this point, I'm thinking maybe it was a, a big buck or a pig and maybe they winded me and they just slipped out and I didn't hear them. You know, I was just I had a million things going on in my head. So, you know, I accepted it and uh, I faced forward again. I'm facing west and this came out of the east. The power lines are running north and south, and I'm probably about 25 yards off the power lines on the east side, just to draw the picture a little bit. 
so yeah, I accepted it and uh, face forward. And then it gets to the point of the day where the sun is right up over the trees. It's not behind the trees, but I'm getting totally blinded. I mean, I can't see anything. I mean, I had to pull my hat down. You know, I had to put my hand over my hat just to kind of look and out in front of me because, you know, I was being blinded by the sun. And all of a sudden, in my right peripheral, about 150 to 160 yards north down the power lines, I kept something black. So I turned towards it, and whatever this is, it's on all fours. And I'm like, wow, look at this bear. We do have bear in South Mississippi. We have black bear, but they're not really abundant. A lot of them are brought here from other states just to see if they can make it. I've caught them on trail cams before. They usually have an orange collar on where the state released them or whatever, tracking them, whatever they're doing. That's what I thought it was. It was right of me. So, you know, naturally I go to my gun and just put it in the scope to look at it. Definitely wasn't going to shoot it. That's another thing. There's no hunting season for bear in Mississippi. If you shoot a bear, you're in a lot of trouble. But, you know, I just wanted to look at it. And I had to look at it left-handed because it was to the right of me. So, you know, I finagled my scope and got to looking at it. And, uh, you know, I had to power my scope up a little bit because it was down there a little bit. And the first thing I noticed, this thing is sitting down now. I guess trying to get this thing in a scope, I didn't get a chance to see it from all fours go down to a sitting position. But it looked just like a person sitting down, a very large person. So I looked at it in the scope, and the first thing I noticed that stood out to me was the hair on the back. The hair on the back wasn't like what you would think the double undercoat of like a dog or a bear would be. It wasn't nothing like that. It was hair. It was like human hair, long human hair. Sure enough, hair like Nikki Six Motley Crew hair, for sure. And there was spaces in between the hair where you can see the skin, and the skin was ashy gray. And I noticed his left hand was digging in the dirt. Like, I don't know if he was pawing for bugs or whatever. And it really threw me off. You know, I'm bare the whole time. But at the same time, I'm like, why does this thing look like this? My mind starts scrambling again. I'm like, what is this? Maybe I'm just looking at this at a weird angle. So I went up to the head and that's when I got scared. That's when I started getting scared. The top of the head, the hair on the head was not long like the hair on the back. It was just short, short and spiky, very ape looking like. But but the shape of the head, it had the conical shape to it. Um, it wasn't pronounced like a lot of people talk about, like pointed, very fine point to like a football. Nothing like that. But it, it did have the conical shape, though. It just wasn't dramatic like that. And there was a point where this thing turned its face a little bit towards me, like uh, just turned to the left a little bit. And the face was pronounced black, black, like throughout the encounter, the, the blackest part of this thing was his face for sure. Very leathery looking face. I seen a piece of the eye. The eye was solid black, just like the skin. At this point, I'm looking for a muzzle, you know, like for a bear. I didn't get a muzzle. I got the side of a hooded nose. Very human looking, but uh, much wider, much thicker. And I caught a piece of the mouth. And I, I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. So I screamed at it. And when I screamed at this thing, all in one motion, he just put his hands on the ground and he popped up to two feet like nothing. Like it was nothing. It, 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 it just didn't, it didn't look real the way he did it. I mean, he just went from a sitting position, put his hands on the ground and popped up on the two feet. Then he screams. Uh, the best way I can describe the scream is the difference between, oh my God, the, the way that he did it. It was so strange. It was like a draw up from the gut. And when he turned it loose, it was like the difference between a lion and elephant or being next to a freight train or maybe even 
a speaker at a concert, it rattled your body. And he was a, he was a football field and a half away from me. And it just, you, you, you can feel it hit you, man. I mean, it just, it was very, very strange. So he screams and he starts walking in this circle, you know, like this oval circle. It was very, that was another, you know, there's a lot of high strangeness to this encounter. Um, you, you're going to, you're going to see this. He starts walking in this oval pattern and he's scanning the trees. He's looking north, south, he's looking west, and then he would look my way. And But every time he would look my way, his eyes would get really big. He wouldn't look directly at me, but he would just look my way. And it just looked like his eyes was getting big. I had him, I had him pegged the whole time. I had him in my scope the whole time. So uh, he did that a couple times. And there was a point where he looked my way. And I think I may have moved. A, a, I can't remember what what caused this it's not coming back to me right now but uh there was a point where he did look directly at me and it's he you know when you see the patterson gimlin film or the freeman footage or stuff like that it's always them walking away they don't want to be seen it was complete reverse he walked straight to me straight to me he starts walking towards me and this thing is talking why he's walking to me. And it's very Tasmanian devilish. It's not too loud, but it, but it's you. I didn't, it, it just sounded to me like a, like a foreign language. It was just very, a lot of clicks and pops and whistles. A lot of, uh, I can't, I wouldn't be doing it any justice, but it was kind of like a, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, kind of thing he was doing. But when he was walking to me, the motion that he was making. It was very uh, strange. He looked like he was covering a lot of ground in only a few steps. Uh, the, I always tell people the, the motion he was making was like maybe he was on a pair of snow skis or maybe like an elliptical machine, something like that. So I look down at my gun. This is, this is where it gets strange. I look down at my gun and I unbolted the chamber just to look in there to make sure I had one in there because I was pretty sure I was going to have to shoot this thing because he's just started walking towards me. I, I didn't even, and Sasquatch is still not coming to my mind right now. I'm thinking this is some kind of monster. So something that uh, nobody's talking about, something that nobody's telling us about monster. I unbolted my chamber and I slammed it back shut and, uh, you know, four or five seconds, five seconds, that's giving it a lot. I think that's too much time, to be honest with you. So, and that amount of time was very short. And I look back up, now he is 30 yards in front of me. Now, I can't explain that. That's, like I said, there's a lot of high strangeness to this. So, there was a dogwood tree that he was right next to, and he kept... Uh, moving his head around it. It wasn't like uh, he wasn't ducking his whole body though. He was just kind of moving his head around it every now and then. And it was a staring contest for the longest time. I put him back on a scope. He's 30 yards in front of me now. And he just looked like a big black blob in the scope. I had to power my scope back down. And when I got the right yardage, that's when I really got the scene good. Uh, this is where the details are going to come. Uh, the face, like I said, was pronounced black, eyes solid black, not round, though, no. uh, more of an almond shape to it. Uh, the nose was hooded like ours, but ve uh, much thicker. The bridge of the nose was much thicker. The nostrils didn't flare out. They, they pointed down, but they were much, you know, the holes in the nostrils were still much bigger than ours. Hair on the head was short. His arms, his 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 arms, I would say about his fingers were very long, but I would say the palm of his hand went past his knees a little bit. He had super long, super long arms. He was very burly, but cut up too at the same time. He had a lot of de uh, definition, especially in the legs, especially in the legs. The fingernails were jacked up. Like maybe if you've seen the hands of like somebody that's 
into like heavy, heavy construction. Uh, fingernails were uh, a lot of them were broke off, and it, it was very nasty looking. And I can also remember if you look at your fingernail, you know how you have like the white moons in your fingernails. He had them, like the, the maybe you call that the cuticle or whatever. I can remember seeing the white moons in there, but the, but the meat was purple. There, there's a lot that went on in a short amount of time. I would have to say from the time I seen this thing to the time I got out the tree was probably about 20 to 25 minutes. So again, short, I, I say short amount of time, but it, the encounter was actually pretty long. So I can see his face and you could tell this wasn't just some stupid animal. This was a thinking, uh, whatever this was, it was, it, it, there was a lot of emotions in his face. I don't know how to explain it, but you, you can tell whatever this was, he was thinking, you know, he was thinking maybe doing the same thing I was doing. What am I looking at kind of thing? This thing was definitely a thinking being. It was not, um, it, it, it wasn't like a silly coyote, just a, just a creature in the woods. This was a, some kind of people. What, wasn't sure what it was, but you can tell this was a thinking being. And every now and then he would shuffle a certain way that would scare me and I would draw down on him. And what I mean, you know, I had the gun on him the whole time. But when I say draw down, like getting ready, acting like I'm fixing to shoot this thing, he would turn his head to the side. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't turn his body, he would turn his head to the side just a little bit. And one eye would be looking at the ground and the other one would, would, would be looking at me. And he was giving me that look like, don't do it. You better not do that. Do not do that. That happened several times in this encounter. That's why I think these things definitely know what guns are. I think they have a language. I, I'll get to that. So, like I said, a lot happened in a short, there was a point where he did like a yawn and that's, uh, he opened his mouth. I don't know if he was trying to barrel his teeth at me or, if, or, or if maybe a yawn is something that they do like, like something defensive or, uh, you know, I just don't know, but he did like a yawn and that's when I got to see his teeth, his teeth were, they were like ours, but much thicker, more like, uh, big white chiclets in his mouth, They're like horse teeth but even thicker and wider than that, just humongous. His mouth was huge, not big lips, just a very big mouth. Like you can put like a whole cantaloupe in this dude's mouth, maybe even a, a small watermelon. I mean, it was big. And um, the inside of his mouth, I seen, I seen the gums, the gums were dark purple or even black, no whites in the eyes either. He he was he was staring me down, and nev not one time did I did I see the white of the eyes ever. Like I said, it was like he had solid black marbles in his eyes, but almond shaped, not round. So there's a lot going on in, in my mind at this point. He's not going anywhere. This, this, he never he never would get any closer than thirty yards, but he would never back off either i mean it's like he stayed within that range he wouldn't get any closer but but he wasn't going anywhere and i'm looking at the sun and i know the sun is now past the trees it hasn't quite set yet but it's fixing to set and whatever i'm looking at I, i'm gonna be in the woods with this thing when it's pitch black and the only light source that i had was a little old silly little ball cap light just to help me get out of my tree you know, because I had the power lines to walk down. You don't really need a big light for that. It's it's a cut power line. So, you know, I didn't bring a big flashlight or anything. And I'm going to be in, it's going to be pitch black pretty soon. And every time, like I said, every time I would draw down on him, he would turn his head to the side. Gave me the look. Don't do it. Do not do that. So I had to make a choice. I said, I have to get out of here. I have to, what am I going to do? So I made a choice. I, I went to draw down on him for the last time and he didn't move his head this time. He just looked at me. Just sat there, looked at me like, like, like a puzzled kid. And I put him in a scope and I put the X 
not right between his eyes. I hate I hate talking about this part, but um, I put the X on his forehead, not not right between the eyes, and uh, I got halfway through the squeeze and I couldn't do it. I don't know why I couldn't do it. I just uh, I can't I can't I just couldn't do it. I don't know what stopped me. I don't know. You know, I was thinking a lot of things was going on in my mind. You know, I didn't know if uh, if this was a person I'm killing. And I, and as close as he was in the in the caliber gun that I had, I'm sure I could have killed it. But I just and I'm glad I didn't. But I mean, you know, what happens when I get out of here and get some sort of authority am i going to go to jail for the rest of my life he just looked that human in the face i mean he didn't look exactly human he looked more neanderthal or caveman in the face but i just couldn't pull the trigger and i just gave up you know i put my gun down and i, I stood up in my stand and i basically committed suicide and just reached out to him and screamed at him and said what do you want i, I i'm sure there was some profanity in that and when i did that everything changed Everything changed. He screamed from 30 yards away and I got to see it. And I hope that nobody in this, in this lifetime has to see the way they do it, or at least the way he did it. It was another draw up from the gut. But when he turned it loose, it was the weirdest thing ever. It was like something out of a DC comic book. It just didn't look real. His eyes, his nose, his mouth protruded out. It looked like his face melted. His eyes, his nose, and his mouth protruded out about 11 to 12 inches. And when he blew, it just about knocked me out the tree. It was the loudest thing. It was the loudest screech. I I tell a lot of people this uh, when I talk about my encounter. You know, I did, you know, I did some time in Iraq, and when a bomb would go off. You know, it'd go off a mile away. You knew you were safe, but you could still feel the heat off of it. And it still scare you. That's what I got off this screen. You can feel the heat off of it. And it just looked like it was just, a, when he was screaming, his face just looked so deformed. It just looked like a bunch of meat flapping it, you know, just flapping. It was just very, very demonic, very kabuki look and it, it just it made no sense at all and then when he was done screaming everything went back to normal in his face you know like i said there's a lot of high strangeness he goes back down to all fours and shoots across the power line well a lot of people say well what what did that look like and the best way i it, it looked very unorthodox is the way it looked to me if you ever see like a big dog like a great dane or something they run and it's real sloppy and very lerpy. It looked like that, but it was super fast, super fast. He gets to the other side of the power line. Now he's west, and this guy's ticked off pretty bad. He's pulling up gallberry bushes by the roots and chunking them out in the power lines. Then, in like every fifteen to twenty seconds, he he nails me with that scream again, like. I don't know how he didn't knock me out of the tree with, with, with just the power of that. I, still to this day, I'm puzzled. Every 15 or 20 seconds, he's doing that scream again. And now I'm standing up in my stand looking for this guy. And he starts, in between these screams, he, he starts talking again. And it's very, when I heard the Sierra sounds, it really freaked me out because there, there was a lot of similarity. A lot of... Uh, grunts a lot of whistles a lot of uh you know just I, I wouldn't be giving it any justice at all to try to repeat how he did it it's just it, it's impossible yeah, i mean the best way i can explain the talking is it sounds like these things might have a double set of vocal cords because they can go high low high low high low or super low or super high and there's a lot in their their language from what i heard sounds like a lot of clicks and pops in it too it's just impossible to do impossible so th this thing is knocking trees down too um, he's not knocking down like full full grown 300 year old pine trees but he's knocking small trees down 
And every now and then I see, I see bushes and roots flying up over the bushes right into the middle of the power line. But he's moving further north. And I'm standing in my stand. I got my gun. I'm like, okay, he's going to kill me. 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 There was a point where he got quiet for a minute. And then I heard him scream again, but he's further north and he's still on the west side. You know, I got, you know, head on a swivel. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, when is a good time to get down? I, I can't get, there's no way I can get down now. He's going to get on the other side. He, he's just, he, he's setting me up and he's just waiting for it to get dark. So there was a point where he shot back on my side, but further north, but I seen him cross and it was so fast. It, it was just like a black blur. He gets on my side now and he's vocalizing and I'm just about ready to get down my tree and just go. You know, I keep psyching myself out. I, you got to go now. No, you can't get out of your tree. You got to go now. No, you can't, you know, just that kind of thing. I, at this point, I, I know I'm in shock and I pretty much think I'm clinically insane at this point. So everything gets quiet again. And I'm waiting, I'm listening, it's getting darker. And all of a sudden, about a little bit, a little bit further from where I seen him the first time, I would say about 200 yards north of me in the woods, I heard a tree break and it was fresh. It was that, that fresh snap, crackle, pop, sure enough, green. When I heard that, I come down my tree. Um, you know, I'm, give or take 30 foot, 35, something like that. Um, and I'm in one of them tree climbing stands. You sit on the front part and you use the bottom platform. You, uh, to climb, you have to, you know, you have to sit on it and then bring your feet up and, but your feet is connected to the bottom platform and you just keep going up the tree and, you know, to get as high as I was 30 foot, that's probably about 22 jacks. I was down, I guarantee you, in 10. I left my book bag up there, and I had hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. I had I had a Garmin GPS that was $1,000 easy. I had a pair of uh, Leopold binoculars that was a couple hundred bucks. I probably had two grand worth of stuff, you know, in my book bag. I left it up there. I come down it. The only thing I took with me was my gun. When um, I get on the power lines, I start running for the truck, and... Uh, yeah, I'm running for my life. You know, it's pure adrenaline at this point. And it was strange because it was like, as soon as I hit the power line and started running, it was like, I couldn't, you know, I kept looking behind me and I couldn't see him on the power lines. And they, you know, they were cut that year. You know, the power lines were cut. They were, you know, freshly cut. I would have been able to see him down there. Here's some more high strangeness. I start running and it was like he knew I got out of my stand and he vocalized again. And it, it sounded like he was mad that I got out of my tree, you know, and I'm running, looking behind me, running, looking, and, you know, I don't see him pursuing me at, at this point, but he's still vocalizing like every 30 seconds to a minute, he's vocalizing and I'm running, you know, at this point, I'm, I would say I'm probably 700 yards from my truck easy you know i'm running for my life and i wasn't in the best shape at at this time in my life either you know i was a little heavy so you know i got whooped after about 150 yard run you know i get whooped and you know a fast run goes to a fast walk so you know there's a point on this power line i always call it the halfway mark uh there's like a weird growth it looks like a little small plateau it comes out on the power lines from the east side of the woods, and it only it only comes out to like the middle. I've always called it like the island. You know, that's the halfway mark. When I get to this island, I'm either halfway to my tree or I'm halfway to my truck. I see this coming up, but I, it's still a long way. And I picked up my run again, and now about 40 foot in the woods to the east of me, I hear something crashing in the woods. And I can still hear him vocalizing back there. And I'm not thinking this is another one. You know, I'm just like, what is it? Is this something else that's running from this thing? Maybe it's a deer or a hog that's, 
you know, every time he, maybe they're, it's some kind of animal that's running from this thing every time it vocalizes. So I stopped and it's like, it stopped, but it took like an extra step. So I knew it was something there and I'm listening for the big guy again. I, I don't hear him. So I start walking and this thing starts walking and it's very strange, high strangeness again. Whatever this is, it's mimicking me step for step. I stop, it stops. I start running, it starts running. And it stays just enough in the woods where you can see the bushes moving a little bit, but you cannot see what it is. At this point, the sun has done set, and I'm in nautical twilight. Um, I can still see pretty good, but there is no, there, there, there's no sun. It's, it's done set. And I see my plateau coming up. It's now probably 100 yards, 150 yards away. I'm trying to make it to this plateau. So I start running again. And this thing on the, and like I said, every now and then, big boy vocalizes back there. I know now, present day, this was another one leading me out. But I didn't know this at the time. The way the woods are shaped, this plateau is coming up. And whatever this thing is, it's going to intercept me because it's going to it's going to run out of woods and it's going to have to reveal itself. It's either that or it's going to have to go deeper in. So I'm running, I'm running, and this thing is closing in on me, and I cannot see whatever this thing is. But man, you it's just getting closer, closer, closer. Finally, I had a I had enough, and I cracked a shot in the air, seven millimeter Magnum, uh, really big gun for down here. Uh, that's more of something that they use in the, you know, Montana places like that to hunt elk and mule deer with. It's a rather big gun, but I've always loved that gun. And when I shot that thing, it was like a cannon, man. It was loud. And I just had enough. I just shot and I crossed over the plateau and I start, you know, there's a huge hill after this that I have to crest. And I noticed whatever this was on the side of me, everything stopped. Everything stopped. I never, I didn't hear him back there anymore vocalizing. Whatever this was that was paralleling me was no longer doing it. And all I can remember after that was a huge hill I had to crest because there's no mountains in Mississippi. It's pretty flat land, but we do have some hills. And, so, and this area I was in had a lot of hills. And I crest this big hill. I can see my truck now, but it's still way down there. I can just see like the hood of my truck. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not the hood, the roof of my truck. Uh, I couldn't see the tires or the. When I seen my truck, I caught another gear I didn't know I had. I'm running for my life, and it seemed like it took me no time to get to my truck. And I can remember getting to my truck and saying to myself, you "Might get your truck." Don't stick around. Don't let the curiosity get the best of you. Get out of here. I stuck the key in my door to open my truck, and I heard one more scream. And it was way back there, but it was still super loud. It was, and it was way different. It was like a, another draw up, but it was like, it was weird. It was like the screech of a baboon, I want to say. And at the end of it was like the crack of a whip, like ta cow. That scared me. I got in my truck and um, this this road I was in, ha, you go two miles and there's a cul-de-sac and you turn around and pass back through. I wasn't doing that. I wasn't passing back through there. I backed up into the ditch. I almost get stuck. Um, I couldn't imagine if I, if I would have got stuck, what that would have been like. That would have been pretty bad. I did almost get stuck, but I got out and I'm flying down these dirt roads. Uh, that's all it is. It's just dirt roads, this management area. You know, every corner, you know, the butt end of my truck is swing. Uh, you know, I probably almost wrecked a dozen times getting out of there. I finally catch blacktop and uh, I'm on Highway 26 and I'm going, I got the foot to the floor still. And we're talking about, it's it's in the 30s outside. By the time I get my truck and I'm on interstate, I'm profusely sweating and I had my shirt off and I, I got it gunned down to the floor. I, I'm surprised I didn't get pulled over. I was going as fast as my little GMC hunt truck would possibly go. 
I catch Highway 15 back down to the Mississippi coast. Now I'm in town. I get home and, you know, I live in a neighborhood. Okay. I live in a city. I live in a, I don't live in a huge, in a huge city, but you know, I'm in, I'm in town. I live in a small casino town. I got neighbors right next to me. I'm, I'm psyching myself to get out the truck and I'm, and I'm home. So, you know, I can remember putting my gun on the bed and I can remember getting in the shower, full blast cold. And I laid in the fetal position for about an hour, just trying to think what it was, what just happened to me. And uh, I can remember getting out of the shower after a long time, putting my clothes on and just, I guess it was the adrenaline dump kind of thing. I just passed out on my couch and um, I can remember waking up the next day and I thought that was a dream. I was like, God, that was so vivid though, man. So I walk in my room and my gun sitting on my bed and I'm like, wow, wasn't no dream. Was it? So yeah, you know, throughout the years, uh, it took me a long time after that incident to, uh, I started wondering if I was crazy so I started doing research after that on the internet, but it, it messed with me for a long time. I had, a, I lost my job over this. I, I wasn't going to work. I had a very good job. And, uh, my attendance ended up being pretty bad because I just didn't want to leave my house. It would even freak me out to just go to, uh, the grocery store to get groceries. If it was nighttime, I wouldn't go. It, it messed with me pretty bad, man. Anytime I would go see my daughter, you know, she lives out in the woods, man. And uh, just driving to her, her house, it was like somebody took a cold bucket of ice water and just poured it over my head. They had to come see me at, at one point. I, I just couldn't do it. And I, and I always made excuses, too. I didn't want to tell anybody what happened to me because I was so afraid of ridicule and never being a respectable human being again after telling the story, I guess I can say it messed with me really bad for a long time. Even just to research, it probably took me about six months. So the first person that I reached out to was a uh, Wes Gimlin off of uh, Sasquatch Chronicles. And he helped me. He did. Uh, we did a show and, uh, we had to redo it a bunch of times because, you know, I've gotten better at telling this throughout the years. I used to cry a lot and, you know, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a lot better. I'm still nervous, but I don't lose my cool as bad as I used to. So back to the story, just reflecting. I don't, I don't like calling them creatures, man, because I don't think they are. I think they're people. I thought, I, I just think that if the, if there's a missing link, that's got to be it. It's got to be. If, the, if, there, if there's a missing link out there, that's got to be what it is. I just, I, I just can't wrap my head around it, you know? So back to hunting. It affected my hunting a lot. I have been hunting ever since I've been a little boy. Uh, my dad took me in the woods with him when I was five and six years old. I can remember sitting up in a tree stand with him. He taught me everything. And what happened to me definitely stole that from me. Still to this day, I hunt. I still hunt. But I just can't get, I can't go miles deep in the woods anymore. I just, I, it's done, I'm not healed. I'm not, I'm not healed up for that yet. I, I still hunt, but I hunt very close to my truck or somewhat. And, and even when I hunt, I'm still not a hundred percent comfortable when I'm up the tree. It's, it, it's always any little noise. Uh, oh, it's, uh, it, is it one of them again? And it's probably always going to be like that. I, I hate, I hate that. And the whole process of hunting, it's not even just enjoying the kill and stuff like that. It's just the process. It's checking your cameras. It's just being out there is what I love. And, uh, I'm getting a little better. So the hunting season prior to my encounter, 
I, I just couldn't do it. I think I went one time and it was like in somebody's backyard in a box stand and I had somebody with me. And then um, when it started getting dark, I'm like, yeah, we got to get out of here. And, you know, they're like, no, what are you leaving for? This is like prime time right now. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm just not feeling good. What's wrong? Oh, you, you know, I, I think I might have ate something. Always make an excuse. Didn't want to tell nobody. I think I might have ate something bad. Let's get out of here, man. So last hunting season came around and right before season, I was getting a little bit better. So, you know, I started scouting again. So, you know, I started feeling better. I, you know, I was still a little creeped out, but I was, I was getting better. I was getting a little cocky. I was putting trail cams out. I was putting corn out and stuff like that, the normal stuff. And, There was a couple times in early archery season that I hunted. Nothing happened. And I'm like, okay, you know, it doesn't have to be the end of the world. You know, nothing happened. Maybe that was a once in a lifetime thing, you know. By this time, I knew what what, what I had seen the first time because I did a lot of research. Yeah, so I don't have an exact date. I, I know it was probably... In between October, October the 15th or 20th of last year, me and my brother found a new spot. My brother, he, he's an avid hunter too, but he, lo- he loves killing pigs. That's his thing. You know, I'll kill a pig, but I'm more of a deer hunter. But we found a spot and it was probably about, give or take, about an hour and a half west of where my encounter happened. It was more closer to the Mississippi river, more in the Delta area, a lot more swamps and stuff like that. And, uh, there was a lease we was hunting on. We got in a lease that year, but it was very remote, probably more remote than where my encounter happened. I mean, if if you look at this place on Google earth, there is nothing there. I I think the closest thing is probably 30 miles away and it's just a couple of houses old country houses. And, uh, I can remember going in there with him and it was more, it was a huge bottom. We was in, we was hunting in and you go through the bottom and there's a huge, huge levee after that. And then you had the Mississippi river. Yeah. We was in our bottom and we put trail cams out and I can remember we used to always have to go in the woods to check our trail cams, then just bring, the little chip in and just put it in your computer and then see what you have coming in. But we converted to the uh, cell phone cams where, you know, it takes a picture of whatever it is, a deer or whatever. And then it just, it'll, it'll shoot you a text back and you can just look at it on your phone. You know, I thought that was neat. Cuts out a lot of walking and a lot of work. So, uh, we was going to hunt it one afternoon. He was going to get about, Two or 300 yards either behind me or ahead of me. It was archery season. I had my crossbow. And uh, for some reason, he couldn't come. So I was like, well, you know, I'm getting too many good picks down there. I need to be down there. So I went down there. And uh, I wasn't far from my truck at all. I was only probably this time about about 200 yards. Um, It was basically where I parked my truck. Walked down to this bottom, and it was a steep, steep, steep hill. You really had to watch yourself going down it. Like, (laughs) you had to dig your heels, man. So I get down to this bottom. I already had a tree stand hung. I get up the tree. It's the same kind of stand I was in. Same situation. I get up. This is early archery season, so it's more autumn. So it's getting dark more like around 630 instead of 530. It was right before uh, the time change went in. So we was getting an extra hour. Same kind of deal, though. You know, I got up my tree. It was it was another pine tree. It was in the bottom. And I always get up high. Got up nice and high, probably 35, 40 foot. And uh, same kind of situation, man. No action. No nothing. Crazy, you know. It, it's a, I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? So I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to be a trooper, stay to dark. And my truck's right there. And uh, 
Yeah, I hunted all the way to dark, and there was absolutely nothing. And it was just just like the first time, strange. But, you know, it's dark now, and I'm getting ready. You know, I'm standing up in my stand, and I'm undoing my harness. That way I can come down the tree. I grabbed my book bag, and I slung it on my back. And at this time, I done lowered my crossbow down to the ground. And all of a sudden, I hear a tree knock in front of me distinct like pat 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 and then an answer straight behind me pat 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 and then after that second one it was like no time after the first one whistles and it was it was a distinct whistle it sounded like a human whistle but it just a lot more sharp and loud and i get a whistle behind me and I, oh no 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 i'm getting out of here nope 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 i i know what this is now i'm educated I come down the tree <laughs> very fast. And uh, like I said, I'm in a bottom. It's nothing but dead leaves and twigs and sticks everywhere. And as soon as I put my foot on the bottom floor and I crunched, the woods exploded. I had stuff running, heavy, heavy stuff running straight in front of me, behind me, stuff running towards my truck and stuff running north. The woods exploded. And to this day, I still cannot say that was a bunch of Bigfoot that took off. Maybe it was juveniles. I'm not sure. And it could, hey, it could have been pigs. I don't know because I wasn't really listening to see if it was bipedal. It just scared me. You know, I had a nice light at this time. I turned my light on and I went straight to my book bag and I grabbed my pistol. And I've got one magazine in my gun and I've got two magazines in my pocket at this point. I start walking. I grab my crossbow. I got it over my shoulder. I know I don't have that far to go. And uh, I probably walked not very far at all, uh, 60, 70 yards and I make a very sharp left down this game trail to start making this steep hill that I was talking about coming up. And uh, I did something very irresponsible. I just want to tell your viewers that it was out of pure panic and fear. I'm thinking this is happening to me again. I make this sharp turn and straight in front of me, not far away at all. I hear a loud like grunt, the, like like a fierce grunt, and then whatever it was that took off, just took off through the woods. And I emptied my whole magazine into nothing, something that I wasn't sure about. Reflecting on it, it's just not a very ethical, and it, it was just out of pure panic is what it was. I speed loaded another magazine back in and uh, I start making this hill and it's steep. Like I'm having to grab on to like little saplings and vines and stuff to pull myself up this hill. It's a lot easier to go down than to get back up. And I can remember struggling with this hill because I had a crossbow on my back and, and a backpack and, you know, trying to f finagle a pistol in my hand at the same time. Once I get on the flat land again, repeat. Straight to the right of me again, loud grunt, and it just takes off. And I did the same thing. Emptied my gun into nothing. I slammed another magazine in my gun, and I get to the road. I see my truck. I threw everything in my front seat. I didn't tear out of there like I did the first time in my first encounter because this road was a lot worse. If I would have panicked, and I could have drove myself off a cliff in this area. I drove out responsibly. I didn't haul tail home or nothing like that, but I can remember getting home, and I can just reflecting back. I'm, I'm like, wow, did it happen again? But at the same time, I don't know because I didn't have a visual. But I don't know any pigs that knock on trees and whistle. And the area I was in was just – it was just – too vast and too remote to have any kind of person out there. It, it's private property. 
somebody going out there to play a trick on me would have to go through hell and back. I, I, it's just not possible. I can't make sense of it at all. So I guess uh, reflecting back on you know what happened to me, I think either we are a part of them or they are part of us. I don't know where that splits as far as DNA goes. And throughout the years, I've learned about other cryptids too. You know, I didn't know anything about, you know, now I know there's a lot of talk about Dogman. You know, you have people even talking about Thunderbirds and just other cryptids. You know, I knew nothing about all this. So what I did is I made friends with Wes German and he introduced me to Carrie Arnold and Carrie Arnold lived very, uh, relatively close to him. He's from South Mississippi too. I just never knew who he was. He helped me out a lot. And, uh, right before he passed, he says, you need to create your own channel. And he says, very therapeutic. And, you know, cause I always told him, I says, I, I want to talk to other people that's had this happen to them before. And uh, yeah, to make a long story short, I, I created my channel. It was already there this February. It was just getting content and stuff like that. And the name of my channel is Red Creek Mafia 777. And you can also reach me via Twitter. It is Red Creek Mafia 7. Or you can reach me on Facebook. My name is Mike Bluler. That's B-L-E-U-L-E-R. And I also have a cryptid page on Facebook. It is called Mafia in the Holler. That's where I do a lot of my stuff, too. My very first episode was with Ron Moorhead, and I'm very proud about that because I didn't have to use anybody. Nobody like did a favor for me or anything. Like I basically went to his website, emailed him, and he was like, sure. And that's about all I got right now. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. The sound of a memory brings me back. To the bluegrass playing on my dad's eight track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking their bells to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah In the drummer of Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Peace of the city life drives me wild The only tune is the cars rushing by on the stereos booming When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Some make all the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the drummer on Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out the country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from
Mama's best sweet tea. Got the sound. 